Is this mic working now? You can hear me? Okay, good. Works better with a battery. I was telling Rob, <laughs> I take this battery home with me when I'm done because if you leave them here, they just die. So um, when he got up here with it on, he didn't even have a battery. And that was my fault. Sorry, Rob. Didn't mean to embarrass you. Um, I was talking to a young man, I, I guess about three or four years ago, and I'm um, talking to him about God, and he said, I just don't believe all that stuff. And it was somebody near and dear to my heart, so it kind of hurt me when he said that. I said, why not? And he said, I'm just not seeing it. I said, what? You know, I'm just not seeing God. And so um, I didn't really know what to say, and it just caught me off guard. And um, I went off and thought about it, and... Uh, after a lot of thinking about it, I still didn't know what to say. And um, it was before I came over here, actually. And then after I got over here, th that conversation replayed in my mind quite a bit and um, about, you know, just not seeing God. And I thought, well, I guess he hasn't seen God, maybe. And so um, I, was, I was going through a time where I was a little bit discouraged and I hadn't seen God. And I said, God, I'm just not seeing you. I'm just not feeling it. I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling your presence. And so... Um, I felt like God said, gave me permission to see him in his people. I knew from scripture, God lives in his people. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he comes with us and dwells in us. And so I knew that he lives in his people. And where two or three are gathered, there I am among you. You've heard that verse before. So he, he started showing me glimpses of himself in you guys, actually, is where this all started. And, and it gave me a, a fresh excitement about coming to church, about gathering together with God's people, because he started showing me glimpses of himself. So um, that's that story. And it will have something to do with Psalm 84 before it's all over. So I just want to tell you that. Psalm 84 has been called the Pearl of Psalms by Charles Spurgeon. By the way, if we keep mentioning Charles Spurgeon, he was a Baptist preacher that was called the Prince of Preachers back in the 1800s in England and has tons and tons of transcripted sermons out there on the internet that I encourage you to go and read if you, know, if you ever want to just hear a good solid sermon. So um, that's who Charles Spurgeon is. It's very hard to translate this particular um, psalm. I, I ran into some problems when I was looking you know, to see what the original was and what the real intent was. It was like the commentators were like, we don't know. <laughs> so some of the verses are almost incomprehensible. So I will be taking some liberties with the translation of this, and I'll tell you when I'm doing that, when, when I'm telling you, okay, here's the picture I have in my mind of what's going on here, and you can decide, you know, whether that sounds like it's consistent with Scripture. Um, the overriding theme of this psalm is about a longing for God, though. And that, that part's easy to see. If you read this whole psalm, you know when you get through. This is about longing for God. Um, as I read through it several times this week, I noticed that there's like three segments. The first four verses are like expressing a longing for God or his dwelling place from a distance. It's like it's way over there and, and I miss it and I long for it. And then the next um, uh, verse five through seven seems to describe like a pilgrimage, like, okay, I'm going to God's dwelling. I'm making my way there. And then the last verses, um, 8 through 12, the travelers, the pilgrims, finally get there, and they're having this conversation with God, I believe. You, you can decide when we get there and see what you think. So I'm going to go through this verse by verse, and um, some take longer than others, but I'll just, I'm just going to go through it verse by verse, and let's just see what it has to say to us. Um, so verse 1 and 2, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. So what's God's dwelling place? Well, when this was written, I believe that the tabernacle was what they had. That was God's temple. They, didn't have, they hadn't built the brick and mortar temple yet. So they just had the tabernacle, which is a big tent. And so this psalm was most likely written about the tabernacle. In fact, it's translated in some translations as, um, how lovely are thy tabernacles, or thy dwelling places. So um, I think that it was the tabernacle at the time this was written. And I was thinking the tabernacle, I call it in the transcript here, a dusty old tent. 
I think it was probably a, a really impressive tent, actually. It was a beautiful tent. But still, it was just a tent. So um, why would somebody say it's lovely? I think it's because it's not the dwelling, but it's who dwells there that makes the difference. And I, I was thinking about this, and it reminded me of, of a story of a young man who, every time he went by a certain house, it, there's a neighborhood with all these houses that look exactly the same. You know, there's just a little um, spec houses that they make. And every time he went by this certain one, his heart would start racing. And the reason is because there was a certain young lady that lived in that house that he had a crush on. And so there was nothing at all special about the house. And when he went by, he would always look, you know, at the house like she's going to come out or something. And she never came out. But he still would be excited. Every time he was in that neighborhood and went by that house, his heart would race. And it's because of who lived there. And so this is the same thing we're dealing with here. The psalmist is talking about the tabernacle with such excitement, even though it's just a tent, because of who lives there. Um, so where does God dwell now? The tabernacle's not around anymore, that we know of, or it's very well hidden. And the temple is even not around anymore. So God doesn't live in a, in a house built with hands anymore. He lives in our hearts, right? So 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? There's two or three other verses that I, I might read later that um, say a similar thing. So how can somebody be so excited about these dwelling places? Um, I was looking at this and I thought, man, this guy's like a little more excited than I think I could ever get or I've ever even seen anybody get about God's dwelling place. And so why is he so excited? And a lot of times when somebody's like really excited about something and I'm not, I realize it's because they've seen something or tasted something that I haven't. So um, I just wrote, wrote a little prayer in here. Lord, may we experience your presence such that nothing else will satisfy us. Amen. Okay, verse 2. That was verse 1. It's going to go a little faster. Don't worry. Verse 2. My soul longs and even faints. And my heart and my flesh cry out. Um, that is not what the English Standard Version says. In fact, most of the translations I saw said, my heart sings for joy, right? My heart and flesh sing for joy. So <laughs> I was like, man, that's way different. Cry out and sing for joy is kind of a different word. So I looked it up, and uh, there's a Hebrew word there. I think it's ranan or renan or something like that. It means both of those things. And so the translators have to look at it and choose. So this morning, I'm going to choose cry out. Okay? I'm not really taking any liberties. That's a valid translation. It's just that most people don't translate it that way. The reason I am is because it says, My soul longs, faints for the courts of the Lord. And then it just says, And I'm singing for joy while I'm longing and fainting. That didn't, to me, that didn't, that wasn't really consistent. So I think my heart cries out is, is how I want to put this. Um, so there's, I, I put a couple of verses in the transcript that it's from the same um, root as the cry in Psalm 17.1 and Lamentations 2.19. If you look those up, those are people crying out like in distress or in, you know, under duress. Um, there's a great word picture for cry out in John Trapp's commentary on the Old Testament. I've never heard of him either. Crieth aloud, as, and this is Old English, so pardon me, especially if the English isn't your first language. This is Old English, and I'll explain it. Crieth aloud, as a child when hungry, crieth every wit of him, hands, feet, face, all cry. And then the mother flings by all, and she flies and outruns herself. So here. Okay, so what this means, <laughs> this is pretty Old English. Um, it means to cry out with every bit of your body. Every wit of him it means every bit of this baby is crying out. And you've probably seen a baby like this where it's not just a voice thing. It's a body language thing where he's crying out with his entire body. And then the mother flings by all. That means she, she throws down what she's doing and runs to him. And this, this is just a beautiful picture of us crying out to God and picturing God putting down what he's doing. I mean, I know he doesn't have to do that, but and coming to us. So it says and she outruns herself. So this is how it is here. We're crying out to God with that intensity. Or the psalmist is, I mean. This almost sounds like someone 
going through withdrawals from an addiction. When I look at um, my soul longs and faints, and then my heart and flesh cry out, it, it almost sounds like somebody has had something taken away from them that they were addicted to. So um, you can't really feel this way unless you've partaken or become addicted. Again, it's hard to understand someone's pining or withdrawal unless you've tasted what they're longing for. So, I mean, addicted is a bad word, okay? So that implies drugs or whatever, but you can, you can get addicted to good things, I believe, and I believe this is one of those things, God's presence. Um, Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So God's encouraging us to taste and see that he's good. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This popped into my head. I mean, how many of you think of pleasure when you think of God? When you think of going to church, do you think of the word pleasure pop into your head? I mean, I have to admit, for a lot of my life, I did not think of church as a pleasure. So um, there was something I had not tasted yet. Um, one more thing. To the living God. Okay, so this is the last little phrase in there. To the living God. This is an important distinction. Um, there's a great quote, again, from Charles Spurgeon. There was no superstition in this love. He loved the house of God because he loved the God of the house. His heart and flesh cried out, not for the altar and the candlestick, but for his God. In other words, he wasn't in love with things. He was in love with the living God. And also this is important because in the Old Testament, they refer to the heathen gods as dead gods. And so God is the living God. That makes him distinct. He's not a block of wood or a piece of stone. He's a living God. Furthermore, EnduringWord.com commentary says... The emphasis on meeting the living God prevents regarding the tabernacle or the temple in the wrong way. The temple as a place could become an odd, ungodly escape, as in 1 Kings 19.9, or an idol, as in Acts 7.48 or 7.54. The psalmist considers it here in its best sense, the place to meet with the living God. So just like going to church could become an idol, and the people at church, and I've been there, where I just wanted to go to church, you know, to meet girls or whatever when I was a kid. Not now, but when I was a kid. And to meet my friends and, you know, hang out and have fun with, you know, and socialize. It was a social event. But, but God is here. If that's all you do, I mean, it's okay if you want to do that. But if that's all you do, you're missing the biggest part of it. God is here. Okay, let's move on to verse 3 and 4. How the sparrows come out on the big screen. Yeah. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Okay, this was just weird. You're talking about, you know, God's presence and all that, and it just starts talking about birds. So this was really interesting. The different commentators had all kinds of things to say about this, but I... One of the first things I saw, which rang true to me, the psalmist may be envious of the little birds that flit around the temple and make nest in its eaves. He seems to wish that he could have his home there and even raise his young there. Another view from James Boyce, an expositional commentary, offered that the sparrow as a picture of small significance and the swallow a picture of restlessness, the insignificant can find their place in the house of God and the restless can find their rest or their nest there near God's altar. I think that's still true. You know, if you feel insignificant or restless, you can find your significance with God. You can find your rest with God. Um, the psalmist refers to God as my king and my God, not just a God or the God. So there in the middle there where it says my king and my God. Um, Let's think about how somebody transitions from just a God to my God, or to, for, to be called mine. Typically, it involves a close relationship with that person. I wouldn't call Fawn a wife or the wife. I call her my wife. So this psalmist 
is embracing God. He has a relationship with God. He loves God. And so he calls him my God. Verse 4. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. This is clearly talking about the priest. Now under the new covenant, we as believers are all priests. So we're dwelling in... Actually, he's dwelling in us. Like I read earlier, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's dwelling in us. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5 says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Since the Bible calls us priests, the implication is that we can and should dwell in God's house. I just want to stop here a second and talk about um, this verse, uh, Know ye not, ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's talking to a plural you, I believe. That, you know, it just says you, know you not, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I believe that we as individuals are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he dwells in us. But I also believe that we as a corporate church are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he dwells in us. And there's a strength in the corporate church. And so when you come here, you're coming to God's dwelling. When we leave here, God's not still dwelling here. He came here with us. But all I'm saying is when you come into a gathering of Christians, you're coming to God's dwelling. And it's so important to have fellowship with other believers because the strength of that as we, as we all come together and God's dwelling in all of us, the strength of his presence, I believe, is greater when we're all together. And so there's just something that goes on there. So that was just a little side note. What verse was I on? Five? Um, Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Okay, so verse 5, what does it mean to have our strength in God? I picture being plugged into the wall. You know, if you have appliances that run on batteries, like everybody has a phone that's on a battery, right? Anything on a battery is just going to run down, right? And I believe if we operate in our flesh without God's strength, we're going to run down too. We'll get burned out and our batteries will run down. But if we're plugged into the wall, like we're plugged into God, it's like an endless... Well, it is. It's an endless source of power, and it never gets weaker, and it never runs down. And so that's, that's I believe, what it looks like to have our strength in God. Um, what is having the highways to Zion in your heart? It just gets harder as you go into this chapter. Um, I like to think of having the highways of Zion in your heart as like either memorizing the way to God's house, like it's just in your heart already. Like some, somehow people know how to get around Busan without a GPS. They amaze me. You know, I just, I'm in awe. <laughs> because they have those directions in their heart. And so having the highways of Zion in your heart is, is knowing where God's dwelling is. I think it also means that that's your tendency. That, that you want to go that way. If you were just set adrift, you know, you would just start just kind of moving that way. It's in your heart to go that way. So that's what I think it means to have the highways of Zion in your heart. And this is also, this is the beginning of the section that's describing the pilgrimage. So there's, um, you know, the, the person has already described how wonderful the house of the Lord is. And now he's talking about the highways of Zion in, in his heart. And he's starting to move out in that direction. Um, let's see, verse 6. Those people whose strength is in the Lord have an amazing ability to make dry places into springs of water and bring rain to a thirsty land. This shows the benefit to those around you when your heart belongs to God. So I've met people like this, and you probably have to. You, I, I can just picture them walking along this dry, the, the valley of Baca. There are all kinds of translations. Baca can mean balsam, or it can mean dry, or it can mean weeping. But it's, it's a bad place. It's a bad valley that they're walking through. It's a tough place. And so if it's dry, that would make the most sense, because it says as they go through, they make it a place of springs. 
okay, and then the early rain covers it with pools. So these people that have their strength in the Lord and they're going towards the Lord's dwelling, they're watering as they go along, they're watering others. So if you could just have a picture of, of them encouraging others to go that way and making it possible, as, as they go through this dry valley, they're making springs there. So now the next people that come through, it won't be a dry valley when they go through it. Someone has already gone ahead of them and made it a, a place of pools. I don't even know what all that might mean, but that's a good thing to think about. Am I making the valley, the dry valley, a place of pools as I go through? What am I, how am I preparing the way for others? So, um, something to think about. There's a whole lot of things to think about in here. Um, verse 7. They go from strength to strength. Just like the rich get richer, so the strong in the Lord get stronger until they appear before God in Zion. The Enduring Word Bible Commentary observes, on a normal journey, especially a difficult one, the normal pattern is to go from strength to weakness or to fatigue. Not so with those whose strength is in God. They go from strength to strength. So it's, it's almost unnatural, it's supernatural to get stronger as you journey through this dry valley. O Lord of hosts, verse 8 and 9, O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah, there's a pause there. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. Okay, verse 8. This verse turns the whole psalm into a plea to God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. What's the psalmist praying for here? He's saying, hear my prayer. He wants to get to God's dwelling place, and he wants the strength to get there. That's, that's two things I'm pretty sure he's praying for, and that have been mentioned earlier. Notice that he didn't ask for any material blessing. He didn't say, oh God, make me rich. Oh God, make me comfortable. Oh God, give me a wonderful family. Oh God, straighten out my kids. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't ask for anything on his own agenda. He just wants to be in God's presence. This is a very focused psalm, I believe, in, in that it's just talking about and longing for God's presence. Oh, that our prayers would occasionally center on seeking God's face and not just his hand. I know sometimes I come to God with a grocery list, you know, and say, I want this, 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 and this. Please pick it up on your way home. I mean, that's no way to talk to God, really, if you think about it. So um, this has got to be refreshing for God to have someone ask him, hey, I just want to see your face. I just want to be in your dwelling place. Okay, verse 9. Um, this, this was probably the worst one for me. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. The commentaries were all over the place. Um, the shield may refer to a literal shield or to Israel's king um, who acts as a shield to Israel. Uh, your anointed may be King David, King Solomon, or even the Messiah. These are just things that the commentary said. I wasn't sure what the psalmist was trying to say here. And so um, I just asked God. I said, God, would you just show me something here? So I got to talk about this on Sunday, and it's Friday. <laughs> So, um, not long after that, I just, I got a picture in my, in my head of these guys, you know, making this pilgrimage, and they have a shield in their hand, right? Behold our shield. So there's a shield present, and one of the commentaries said it, you know, it's a literal shield. It could be a literal shield, and I thought, well, why would you have a shield in your hand? Usually, it's because you were just fighting, and so I'm thinking of these guys that had to not only just go through a dry valley, but also they had to fight their way to God's dwelling. And it says, um, Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. And I'm picturing this face that's maybe bloody and dirty from fighting its, his way through. And saying, Look at us, God. We fought our way here. So this is, this is the segment where they're showing up and starting to talk to God. Um, <laughs> where did I get to? I think what, what tipped me off that maybe they had fought their way through is because it says, Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. And then immediately, well, I just paused, so it isn't immediately. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. So let me read that together. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. It's like we fought our way to get here, and this is why. Okay, that four at the beginning of verse 10. This is why. Um, 
before I move to the next slide, it <laughs> doesn't matter, leave it up there. Um, Fawn mentioned, you know, when I, when I was telling her about this part of fighting your way through, and this is, this is not what the scripture says. This is what I pictured when I asked God for a picture in my mind. So I'm not, um, I'm not averring that that's what's really it's saying. But I think this is a good picture. I think you do have to fight your way through. So, you know, if, um, Fawn asked me when I was talking about this, what kind of things are you fighting against to get to God's dwelling? And I thought, well, that's something good to think about. What are you fighting against? I mean, one is just sin, out and out sin. Sin will keep you from wanting to go to God's dwelling. In fact, you know, you look at Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they hid from God. I mean, they could have been walking around with God in the Garden of Eden and the, every day, you know, but when they sinned, the last thing they did was head towards where he was. They hid from him. So sin will keep you from fighting your way through. Um, complacency. If you just don't care or you don't care enough. I think that's, that's part of tasting that. We need to taste and see that God is good. Because if you haven't tasted it, you're going to be complacent. So, I think you have to have a certain amount of faith to start with. To say, you know what? Everybody's saying how, much, you know, how many pleasures are at God's right hand. And how you can taste and see the Lord is good. And... How his dwelling better is one day than a thousand elsewhere. Everybody's saying all that, but I just, I'm not getting it. And it's like this young man I talked to, I'm not seeing it. What if you just had enough faith to take their word for it? I mean, like, like when somebody tells me, hey, there's this restaurant that's really great. You should go to it. You would love it. And they describe it to me even. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I would like that. And I go, based on their word, I go, and, and it's like really good. And so then later, and maybe I had to wait in line, you know, and maybe fight for a parking place, you know, to get in. Later, now that I've tasted it, I won't hesitate to go and, and to wait in line or fight for a parking place, okay? So complacency would be a big thing keeping you away from it. Another one is fear. And fear sounds strange. It's like, why should I be afraid, you know, to, to fight my way to God's dwelling place? Well, one, the fight. Fights are never fun. But two is, I think, a fear of disappointment. What if I fight my way through to get to God and I'm disappointed? I think, you know, you're going to have to take people's word for it. Take God's word for it, the Bible's word for it, that it's worth it. Don't be afraid of disappointment. You will not be disappointed. Okay, now we can go to this slide here. You've been looking at the doorman for a while. Um... Verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So let's think about this for a minute. A thousand days is just under three years. So according to the psalmist, one day in God's court is better than three years. Elsewhere is added on, by the way. That's not in the original translation, but it makes sense if you say a thousand elsewhere. There's many ways to think of this. Um, it might mean you would be willing to trade three years of your life for one day in God's court. So if I came to you and I said, look, you're going to live to be 87. Um, if, you'll, if you'll go down to 84, I'll give you one day in God's court. You know, except maybe, maybe you lose three years now while you're having fun, not when you're 84. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'll give that up. <laughs> so... Um, or maybe waiting in line for three years for one day in God's court. I mean, you think about waiting in line for an hour is a long time. Can you imagine waiting in line for three years? Um, there's, there's another way to look at it that's my favorite uh, that I think is more realistic. Maybe the psalmist is just saying the richness of one day in God's court is like if you took three years and distilled it down to one day. All the pleasures and all the adventures and all the fun and all the amazing experiences that you had in those three years if they were just to happen in one day all the emotions and all that then better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere I don't even know if we can wrap our head around that we might be able to condense maybe a week down to one day and say oh wow that's an exciting day but three years, think of three years all packed into one day. That may be 
a picture of what heaven is going to be like. Okay, what about being a doorkeeper? Well, that's a menial job, and you're kind of on the edge of the household. You never get to go inside. You're just out. You have to stay at the door. Um, so you can be a doorkeeper, or you can dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, tents of wickedness, I mean, that sounds like bad. Oh, I don't want to be there. It's actually, I think, referring to like the, all the pleasures the world has to offer. And so it is, it is somewhere that we might want to be. Our flesh would want to be there, and, and we have been there, and we are quite often there, probably. Um, the psalmist is saying, I'd prefer to have the lowest position in God's house than be the center of attention in a house of worldly pleasure. Um, again, Charles Spurgeon, man, he's helping out today, said it nicely. To bear burdens and open doors for the Lord is more honor than to reign among the wicked. Every man has his choice, and this is ours. God's worst is better than the devil's best. Okay, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Uh, Barnes' commentary says, The sun gives light, warmth, beauty to the creation. So God is the source of light, joy, happiness to the soul. Um, Isaiah 60, 19, The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and, you, and your God will be your glory. I don't know if you've ever stopped and thought about this, but God's, God has called the sun here, and then he's called your light, basically. Um, in Revelation, it's even mentioned, the sun, you won't need the sun to shine anymore, because God will be your light. It's, it's interesting to think of that. If, if you think, of, okay, what if you took away the sun? I mean, we would all die, like, immediately, right? God is going to take the place of the sun in, in the new heaven and the new earth. It says you won't need the sun by day or the moon by night because God's glory will illuminate everything. So um, I just think that's interesting to think of the physics of that even. You know, all of a sudden... All the natural lights are put out. You think, oh, it's going to get dark. No, it's still light. It's, and actually, it's lighter than it was before. There's no shadows at all because God's light is illuminating everything. That's, I just think that's amazing. Um, the Lord God provides all of the things that we cannot provide ourselves. We cannot shed light on our hearts or fully protect ourselves. So God is our sun and shield. We cannot grasp favor and honor you know, it says, the Lord bestows favor and honor. We cannot grasp that for ourselves. The Lord God must grant it to us. Our dependency on him is not a burden or a worry because no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God's not withholding these things from us. If he's the light, he's going to let his light shine on us. And if he's going to grant favor... He's going to grant favor. We, we need to believe that verse. I, when I first saw that verse, I, I asked myself, Joe, do you believe that verse? Do you believe that he withholds no good thing? I think sometimes I, a lot of people look at God as a killjoy. and It's like, he's withholding things from me. I don't want to really serve God because there's all these things that I want, and he's keeping them from me, and I want them. And so we don't trust him that he's not. He won't withhold any good thing from those that walk uprightly. Okay, verse 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. I believe that it's no accident this verse follows the one before it, encouraging us, hey, trust in him. Trust him to do what he said, that to not withhold any good thing. This psalm is all about finding our satisfaction in the Lord God. We have to trust him to withhold no good thing from us. In other words, we trust him to give us good things. Otherwise, we will turn to the tents of the wicked to try to find our satisfaction. We are blessed if we trust in the Lord of hosts because he is the only true source of satisfaction. You know, that's easy to say that. But do we believe that? Is God our satisfaction? Is God satisfying? I want to encourage you to taste and see that the Lord is good, that he really is satisfying, if you haven't yet. 
If you have, maybe it's been a long time. Remember the last time that you tasted and saw that God was good. Okay, we've come to the time in our service where we respond to what God is saying to us or doing in us. Um, we'll have the opportunity to take communion. As we do, pr please reflect on where you've placed your trust.